Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. Uh, the topic is, what is the difference between object storage S3 and cloud storage? With me today, I have David Bolin, Product Marketing Director for Wasabi. I, of course, am Adrian J. Herrera, but David, I want you to introduce yourself, tell everyone what your background is, and then we'll jump into the content after that. So Absolutely. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you for having me here today. I'm really excited about this webinar. I look forward to sharing information uh, with, with the crowd and learning more about DataCore. Uh, I know we've been partners for a long time now, and uh, it's a relationship that I value, and so I'm happy that I could be here. I uh, am, a, like you said, I'm the director of our product marketing team here at Wasabi. Uh, we are a hot cloud storage company. We'll talk about more about that in a moment, but um, Wasabi is, let's see here, we founded in 2015. Our service went live in 2017, so we've got about almost five years worth of uh, of service live up and running. I've been here for almost three years of that. Prior to Wasabi, I uh, was at uh, NetApp, uh, a storage vendor for, for a few years. And before I was at NetApp, I spent a lot of time on the network side. I spent uh, you know a decade or so at uh, Juniper Networks. And uh, before that, it was Lucent Technologies and then um, Ascend Communications and Cascade Communications in the days of Frame Relay and ATM, and I got my start uh, on the network side back in the well the late 80s, early 90s at a little Ethernet company called Cabletron Systems, building uh, Ethernet switches. So the majority of my life has been spent on the network side, and uh, it translates well into uh, cloud and uh, transferring data to and from the cloud. And um, in the last few years, has been all uh, storage. Yeah, so you have very, very relevant experience, and that, that's what I wanted the viewers to hear, your, the, the relevant experience you had in, in your past and, and know where, where your point of view is coming from. Uh, I also uh, come from a pretty strong cloud storage background. I, I came through the acquisition of Coringo. That's how I came to DataCore uh, just a few months ago or at the beginning of the year. Uh, before Coringo, I was on the founding team of a company called Nirvonics, which was one of the first enterprise cloud storage services. It was it was kind of the, the second generation of storage services. This was way, way, way back in 2005, 2006. That seems so long ago. I remember and, Nirvana. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and uh, part of, part of, I was also part of um, uh, direct consumer cloud storage services and, and media organizations, worked at Yahoo for a bit and come to call Music Match. So I come more from, from the media and, and service side and then transitioned into enterprise storage. So I just wanted everyone to, to, to know where our experiences and where our point of views are coming from because this is a, a thought leadership series and, and being part of a thought leadership series, you know, feel free to ask questions throughout the viewers. Feel, feel free to type in your questions. David and, and I like to have conversations through the webinars. We've done a few together. So it, it's okay if you have a question on a particular topic, just go ahead and, and type it into the chat window and as always, David, feel free to ask me questions. I will ask you questions throughout. Uh, but you know, being being part of a thought leadership series, the the first in this series was going over object, file, and block storage architectures and interfaces. Why interfaces don't always give you the value of the underlying architectures. One of the other things that we often see in the market is confusion between object storage, cloud storage, and the S3 protocol. And, and David, you and I have had you know, a conversation about this before. It seems so clear to us because we're so close to it. But uh, you know, people that I talk to are confused and users and partners are confused. And I'm sure you, you uh, experience the same thing. Every so, day, every yeah. day, I get asked the difference between what's the S3 protocol, what's the S3 service. Uh, what's the difference between the different types of cloud storage out there? So yeah, every day. Yeah, and that's hopefully we're going to clear a little bit of that up today. Uh, this is what we hope you will learn: the differences between object storage and cloud storage, the differences between a RESTful interface and standards-based interfaces, uh, the difference between an S3 service and the S3 protocol. I think that one's big. Uh, we covered that. I think pretty extensively on the on-prem side. Now we have uh, an expert like David here to, to walk us through uh, the differences on the service side. 
and then how to determine the right solution or service for your specific needs. So we'll go over a real light matrix uh, to help you with your uh, decision making to fulfill your requirements. And with that, let's uh, let's just jump right into it. We, we wanted to set the stage here, just provide a, a real easy visual to show you the differences. You know, starting at the bottom there, there's object storage in that teal color. Uh, then, you know, cloud storage. Almost every major cloud storage service runs on object storage, but there's a lot of value added services added to cloud storage, and, and we'll go over that. David will do a deep dive at that in his section. And then there's an interface, how you interface with the service, how you interface with the storage. We're going to be, be talking specifically about the S3 API, but almost every storage service out there, what, when they first started, at least when they first started a while ago, had their own proprietary API. Then the S3 protocol, the S3 API, started gaining in momentum and popularity, and a lot of service providers and, and even on-prem storage solutions just started supporting that from a native perspective. Uh, but, but again, we'll, we'll explain that. Yeah, David, anything you want to add here from a level setting perspective or a foundational perspective? Yeah, you covered it well, Adrian. I think we've got a lot to talk about, so um, I don't want to add anything else to our menu. Yeah, yeah. So let's start with object storage. And again, I encourage you to go take a, a, a look at the recording that we have in our, in our webinar section. You can go to datacore.com in the resources section, look at the webinars, and there's one that goes over this topic in detail, you know, block block is really meant for high transaction and high rates of change for data segments. You could think of it as a kind of a, a raw volume that's presented to operating systems and, and systems as a whole, like databases, that kind of thing. You know, then you have file. The file was really meant for collaboration and portability for frequently changing files. It, it was designed in a way that is easy for humans to understand. Putting stuff in directories is very similar to putting stuff in folders. And those concepts were needed when this technology was, was first founded, storage technology was first founded. And then you have object. Object kind of grew up in you know, a little bit um, after file, and it was really meant to provide one massive scalable pool of storage, you know, focusing on ease of management and access at scale. That's why a lot of cloud storage services use object as the underlying storage technology, because when you store something, you get a key and all you need is that key to retrieve it. You know, of course, from the cloud storage perspective, there's a lot of other value adds that are added on top of um, object storage from the operations perspective. You know, the cloud storage service provider manages the, the data and everything. And again, Dave, David will go into that, so I don't want to go too far into that. But we wanted to set the stage with the different storage architectures because you know, this is a, a slightly deeper dive on object storage and cloud storage. Hey, Adrian, can I throw out a couple of definitions here? Sure. Um, yeah, so if we go back one slide just for a second, uh, we talk about block, file, and object. Uh, I want to talk about uh, structured data and unstructured data. So in the case of block data, you may see, uh, or, or block storage, you may see uh, examples of people saying, well, I used block storage for my structured data. And structured data is really going to be anything that fits well into a database, right? So you'll see block storage used with database a lot. If you get uh, more of an unstructured data, that could be anything, well, from uh, of voice recordings or video recordings or PowerPoint presentations or X-rays, anything that doesn't fit well into a database. Well, that's that's a great fit for either file or object. So, you'll see uh, um, you'll see structured and unstructured data, you know, using different types of of storage. Thanks, Adrian. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, we, we do a deeper dive and, and go into data sets too in that webinar. So if you're interested in more what, what David said, we had some product managers, um, Augie Gonzalez and Eric Day, product managers from, from DataCore, uh, do a real deep dive into the different types of data and the, the use cases. So that's it's a really good webinar. Uh, from the object storage perspective, uh, again, we talked about key value. I don't want to spend too much time on this because we have a lot of great information on our site. But the the points to drive home here are that you know there there is this very easy uh, way to access data for an application. So data is stored in a massive pool of storage. It was really designed with applications and scalability in mind. 
and that's that's the point to drive home. And when we talk about scalability, when we talk about scale, we're talking billions, hundreds of billions of files. We're talking thousands to millions of tenants. Uh, we're talking, you know, anywhere between petabytes, hundred petabytes, even you know, approaching exabytes of data. So the, those are the kinds of scale that object storage was des, were, was designed to handle. And of course, you have the associated metadata with the object storage. So the data about the data. In the file system world, sure, you can have data about the data. Usually it's stored in an external database. But with, with a lot of object storage solutions, it, the metadata is just part of the object itself, at, at least uh, you know, some of the best of breed solutions out there. Again, you know, if you if you want more information on object storage, you can go take a look at datacore.com. But from a from a very high level, you know, here here's why users consider object storage. I, I put Swarm object storage because it, it's our product. But from from a from a very high level, when you take a look at why organizations purchase object storage and run it within their data center. It's really because they need to manage billions of files, petabytes of data, and thousands of tenants with limited staff. Uh, we we have a, a number of different organizations that are really struggling with providing distributed access to content and data, and you can do that, and we'll show you why you can do that in a distributed way in a bit. Uh, often organizations require the scalability of cloud storage, but the data needs to remain on site. Uh, whether this is for some sort of, you know, regulation uh, or or you know some some you know privacy concern, uh, if if there's a requirement to keep data on site, maybe there isn't a consistent or persistent you know bandwidth or high speed bandwidth. You know they need to keep that data on site within their own data center, uh, or if if they have already an archiving solution, maybe they put something on tape. Uh, but they they need to access that data now. I think you know one thing that uh, the recent occurrences in the world has showed us is that you just can't lock data up anymore. You can't put it in in a closet. You can't put it you know in in a vault and expect to be able to access it quickly. Uh, sometimes you won't be able to get to that vault. Sometimes you won't be able to get to that you know closet or wherever you have your archives. So you, you you really need to think about keeping that data online and accessible. And th those are really the, the primary reasons why organizations are using object storage today. David, yeah, I know this is an object storage slide, but but do you have anything to, to add there? Yeah, you know what? Uh, I just want to point out that uh, sometimes when we say that the, there are billions of files or billions of objects, that's, that's not marketing. That's the truth. Honestly, we've got customers that have uh, hundreds of millions and in, into the multiple billions of objects stored in, in different buckets. If you think about uh, your average object size, and everyone's object size or, or file size is different, it all depends on what you do with them. Uh, if you have, uh, say, an average one megabyte size object in, in, that you're storing, one petabyte is a billion objects. So if you got two petabytes, three petabytes, you're looking at two, three billion objects that uh, you have to manage and store. Like Adrian said, uh, nothing's better than do, at doing that than object storage. And uh, I'm a big fan of swarm object storage for managing billions in, of, of objects and petabytes of data. Yeah, it's it's funny when you write billions, and it, it is hard to conceptualize billions. But you're 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 right. I mean, we we have many customers storing you know tens of billions of files, and there's no reason that you know the solution can't store hundreds of billions to trillions of files. Yeah, uh, I was just on call yesterday, and and someone said, "Hey, we should put billions of billions." I'm like, "Well, we we could put <laughs> trillions, right? That, that's you're talking trillions there." But but that's the that's the scale that object storage can handle, and the reason it can handle that is because it doesn't have some of the limits of an underlying file system. And and you know, again, that it's it's a deeper dive in the architectures, and that you know, there, there's a lot of good content out there if, if anyone's interested. Uh, if, if, if anyone's interested, you could just we're, we're going to put our email addresses at the end, uh, email addresses for the organizations where you can just go ahead and, and uh, email us for more information. So wanted to do a, a quick a quick uh, use case for object storage, just a level set again, showing you how object storage is used. Uh, you can see the swarm archive there in the middle that that's object storage. You can also have you know, different clusters in a different site and a different DR site. 
Uh, one of those DR sites can be Wasabi. You can just go ahead and set that up in the UI and you have your your key and, and your, your password and your secret key and you just drop it into the UI and specify what data sets you want replicated to Wasabi and it goes to Wasabi. But here, th this is more for a media entertainment use case, but this could be any use case. That metadata controller or, or HSM could be a gateway. Uh, it could be a, a NAS that, that supports uh, the S3 API. Uh, it, it really could be any, any, any data management application. That primary shared storage down there uh, could be, you know, of course, SAN Symphony, another you know, data core product. Uh, I guess I should point out that that metadata controller HSM could, could also be a uh, vFilo. So th there, there's a lot of different ways to architect solutions that utilize object storage. And of course, you can write directly to object storage if that application there on the left uh, just integrated the, the Swarm API or even the S3 protocol, it can write directly to the Swarm archive. And then you get the benefits of the scalability. You get the benefits of the automated management. You, know, you could provide internal archive access directly. So there is a content portal built into the Swarm archive. Users can just log in and only have access to the data sets that they want. Again, you can send a, a, a data set up to Wasabi for disaster recovery purposes if anything were to happen to that primary uh, Swarm archive or maybe even your, your other uh, disaster recovery site within your data center, you can recall that content back from Wasabi, uh, just kind of flip a switch and, and rebuild everything. So it, it just makes it very easy, very flexible. And of course, the data is accessible. This is a tape replacement use case. There's lots of other use cases, but in the tape replacement use case, usually that, that data would have been stored on some form of tape archive to access that data. You needed to go get the tape. You needed to bring it back online. You needed to find the piece of content uh, and then you know, make sure it's accessible. Here in this world, content remains accessible. It's always on disk. Uh, you have metadata so you can easily search for it. Uh, you, you're, you're always protected because you have, you know, your, your disaster recovery site and, and your, your, you know, secondary or tertiary copy up on Wasabi. So again, that there's a lot of different ways to utilize object storage, but I you know, just wanted to give you an example of one use case and then do a deeper dive on, actually it's, it's one of our mutual customers, one that was Wasabi and uh, Datacore uh, both have as, as a customer. And that's, that's Kinetic. That's, uh, they used to be IQ Media, uh, and then they were purchased and, and they became Kinetic. But so Kinetic, they, they have a media intelligence platform. So what they do, they record shows and uh, they record commercials and organizations that are interested in how their brands are performing or how their message is performing in particular markets go to Kinetic and they say, hey, you know, I want you to run this analysis in this specific region uh, to let me know how I'm doing. And that means that they need to record and collect a lot of content, a lot of unstructured data like David was talking about. And furthermore, they need to keep it accessible in perpetuity. So they are experts at recording and collecting data and at analyzing that data after the fact. Uh, so from a case study perspective, you know, when they first started, S3 wasn't huge. You know, they 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 had to make do with the technologies and the storage technologies that were popular at the time. So that meant that they built their solution on Windows File Server, and Windows File Server is is based on a file system, and it was just it it had some scale limits. So they wanted to take advantage of this new storage, object storage, S3 storage, years ago. Uh, but they, they needed to do it in a way that they can plug into their existing files, file system and file server workflow. Uh, so that's when they did their search and they came across, back then it was Coringo Swarm. Uh, you know, today it's DataCore Swarm. But the, the, the benefit is the same. They were able to plug into their existing workflows. Uh, they were able to reduce their RAID rebuild times. They were able to reduce their, their their RAID protection scheme altogether because uh, the objects are, are stored via replication or erasure coding. And they're able to scale. It, it, it just shows you know, the automation that's built in, the data protection functionality built in, how it was applied to 
a traditional workflow by leveraging some of the concepts that we spoke about on the object storage side and also some of the concepts that we're about to talk about on the cloud storage side. So they also use Wasabi for uh, some of their cloud storage needs. I believe I believe they do. I didn't. didn't yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. They do. And uh, you know, I, I, one of the things I love about Kinetic, it, they guys have a fantastic IT architecture. And uh, we'll, I know we'll talk about it later, but a hybrid cloud architecture where you keep the, you know your your hot data uh, on prem, easily accessible, fast, and, um, and and performant. And then you can move your know, your colder data to the cloud for cheaper, deeper storage for uh for off-site backup you know this is the, these guys this, this case study is just a fantastic usage of data core on-prem wasabi in the cloud and uh if anybody has any questions about how this uh, operates just just reach out to adrian and and, and me and uh we'll, we'll go into some detail for it but uh, this is a great ca hybrid cloud case study yeah and i, I think wh why why i like it is because they're doing some cutting edge stuff on the analysis side and and the service that they provide to their users but they're experiencing, I think, a lot of some of the issues that most in the IT world are experiencing. You, know, you purchase certain technologies, and and the the ecosystem, the landscape changes so fast. And you know, you, you make you make investment in particular infrastructure, and then you know, three years, four years down the road, something else comes up. Well, how do you how do you leverage those advancements, right? What what do you do? And I think Kinetic uh, did a really good job of of still extracting. Uh, as much as they could from their initial investment and then creating a, a nice transition, nice bridge to some more current under, you know, underlying storage technologies and foundational technologies. And, and, that's, and that's what I think a lot of these services and, and, and products do these days. You know, we're, we're able to bridge the gaps and be able to, to help you, you know, migrate um, or create a bridge from you know, traditional technologies to these more current technologies and ways of doing things. Sur more service-based approaches, I should say. And with that, so I know we, we put RESTful interface in between the cloud storage section and the ob store, object storage section. Reason being is the main way to interact with object storage is via HTTP, via a RESTful interface. So all object storage solutions if, if they don't have their own proprietary API, they have their own proprietary implementation of the S3 API, and, and we'll go into that in a bit, but we wanted to define what a RESTful interface was, because a lot of people, you, you hear RESTful, and you know there, there's just a lot of confusion. It's like, what is it? Well, RESTful stands for Representational State of, of Transfer. It's really a set of architectural constraints. So it, it's not a protocol, it's it's really a framework. I put standard there, but it should be a framework. And it's just a framework for how requests should be made over HTTP in a stateless environment. So stateless client server environment. Uh, it, 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 there's as, as a framework, there are some guidelines. It needs to be lightweight, it needs to be fast, it needs to be scalable. And because it's going over HTTP, it needs to be fault tolerant. So it needs to be able to expect issues and uh, gracefully work through those issues. So it'll it'll just keep on chugging and working. It it's you know it's basically the way that you talk to services these days. You know back when S3 you know first came out, most organizations were plugging into you know POSIX compliance. Um, storage uh, solutions via standard storage protocols like I don't even want to say well I don't even think it was SMB back then David I think it was uh, SIFS right yes yeah, um, SIFS I don't think yeah. you say that word I don't think you can say that word anymore I think it's, it's no longer you know, popular to say SIFS you got to say SMB yeah exactly Microsoft's gonna knock on my door or something and, and yeah but <laughs> it, um, yeah it's it, it, it and and the reason being is you know, there needed to be standards for applications to talk to you know, the underlying file systems. It, with, without those types of protocols, uh, the ecosystem would not have grown. You would not have had innovation on the application side. It was kind of a little bit different when interfaces came out, when RESTful interfaces came out, because then the innovation really moved to the service side and that's where if if you were to put constraints on RESTful interfaces when they first came out, 
I think you would have stifled innovation from the services perspective. And you know, that that's kind of setting the stage to what's coming next. So David, do you have anything to add to this before we jump into your, your section here? No, you know what, this is, uh, you, you covered it pretty well. Um, I, I just, I, I sometimes like to make a, um, oh, the little, I guess a higher level um, metaphor for how an API works. For because I know that I, I know some of the people that are attending today and, and they are not deeply technical, so they still may be confused or or con question about what actually the API does. I mean, you did a great job, Adrian, of explaining it, to, explain, explaining it, but I'm gonna go a little bit higher and use this metaphor I've seen used a couple times in the past with regards to API. So, um, uh, think of it as all right, we're gonna use a, a restaurant as a metaphor uh, for this. And uh, you're in the process of ordering food at a restaurant. And when you're sitting at the table at a restaurant and you're given a menu of choices to order from, well, the kitchen is the system, right? And uh, they'll prepare uh, what you order, right? But how that kitchen understands what you're going to pick from the menu is important. And that's where the waiter comes into play. And, and in this example, the waiter is the communicator. Uh, he, the waiter is the API, actually, and 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 he takes what you choose from the menu and tells the kitchen what needs to, to be prepared, and then the waiter takes it from the kitchen back to you and uh, at your table. And in this example, the kitchen is the uh, application that has things. The 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 restaurant customer is the application that needs things. And the menu is the list of API calls, the things you can that the kitchen can make for you or deliver to you. And the waiter is the programming interface that communicates back and forth between the the customer and the kitchen. So it's kind of a higher level overview or a metaphor of a restaurant, but I find that it's helpful for people to better understand how an API works if you put food in front of them. Yeah, yeah, and you also made me hungry. So yeah, uh, <laughs> sorry, Adrian. I know it's. <laughs> Lunch time for you over there. Yeah, definitely. It's breakfast time. It isn't even breakfast time yet. But oh, um, so it's uh so let let's let's jump into cloud storage. So we, we set object storage, uh, which is underlying you know architecture storage technology. Uh, we talked about uh, the RESTful API. So just the the framework uh, setting the stage for how you interface with both object storage solutions and cloud storage solutions. So now we're jumping into cloud storage. So with that, David, why don't you explain to us what, what cloud storage is? All right, this is, uh, this is simple. Storage is storage for the most part. Where it sits and who op owns it and operates it and manage it, manages it are two different things. So um, you could have block storage and file storage and object storage on-prem, like Adrian talked about, and in that first webinar, which was, which was covered, or you could have it sitting in the cloud. Um, I'll use AWS as an example. They're the granddaddy of all cloud storage. They launched their service in 2006, and you know that was with originally S3 object storage. Time went by, and they de delivered file storage, EFS, or, and uh, FSx for Lustre or FSx for Windows, and they also have uh, object storage, EBS. So the file block and object can be uh, on-prem or in the cloud. It just is really who owns it and who operates it. In the case of cloud, um, it's on-demand storage. It should be there when you ask for it. You can ask for it, you know, honestly, if you wanted to spin up a couple terabytes today, you could probably get that done in uh, 15 or 20 minutes, right? And uh, if you uh, were done with it, you could be done with it. But between us, there's not a lot of elasticity in cloud storage. Uh, well, I take that back. Not a lot of elasticity in cloud object storage. If you pretty much know what you need and it's not going to deviate too much it may grow it may you may delete some stuff over a period of time but you don't really spin it up or spin it down like you would compute or block um so uh so it's just there for you when you need it and as adrian covered in the restful interface uh this section a couple minutes ago it, it, it's uh, accessible via http super simple to use people understand it it's just there so the infrastructure is managed by the service provider, AWS, Azure, Google, Wasabi, whoever that cloud service provider is. That's where we get the uh, 
that, that that's where uh, that that's who owns it, operates it. So you don't, as as the end user, have to worry about uh, about patches or releases or um, data migrations that much. If you, as 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 Adrian said earlier, one of the nice things about the uh, the swarm piece is that it, it's easy to understand, it's easy to use, and you can do it with the limited staff. Um, if you even have more staff constraints, well, you know, cloud storage is a good option for you too because you don't really need to spend too much time worrying about the day-to-day -day management of cloud storage because that's where the application sits, uh, the application communicates to the cloud storage via the API. And so once you set it up and, and walk away from it, it should be easy to, to, to use and, and, and walk away from. Um, and then from an economics perspective, uh, cloud, uh, cloud storage, you know, it started in 2006. Was it less expensive than on-prem? No, it really wasn't. And in most cases, in many cases, it's still not as uh, as inexpensive. Not inexpensive. It's sometimes more expensive than your on-prem storage, depending on who you use and what you use. There is the option for pay-as-you-go pricing, so you don't need to worry about um, buying a lot of storage up front and then hoping that you have the capacity. You know, as time goes by, because Again, if you only need 50 terabytes, 100 terabytes, uh, you buy 50 ter or 100 terabytes. You don't need to to buy 200 terabytes or 250, knowing that you're going to grow into it. And uh, all this, you know, really does is it allows you to help reduce operational costs. If you are consolidating data centers, or if you have a bunch of old storage out there, or as Adrian mentioned, tape, right? And you say, okay, I don't want to rack and stack any new LTO nine stuff. Um, what do I do? Well, you know what? You can migrate that tape, you know, to to Swarm. You can migrate that to uh, to Wasabi. Hell, you could use uh, Data Core v Philo to figure out uh, which data is new and which data is old, and move that old data off prem into the cloud. And uh, like I, the v Philo product has great dedupe and compression technology that allows you to reduce the amount of storage you need in the cloud. So. You could you, you could uh, reduce your operational costs really easy just uh, by having a hybrid cloud solution that com that that's comprised of a combination of of uh, on-prem storage and applications like vFilo and and cloud storage like Wasabi. Yeah, I guess the point is it really it's really dependent on what your requirements are. Yeah, and we we give everyone a nice little table to to at least help conceptualize. Hey. How do I compare these these different services, different solutions, and how do I make my decisions? I mean, that that's how we close out this webinar. Uh, but you know, it kind of leads to the question: Well, okay, you just you know set the stage with what cloud storage is. Well, what is S3? So, yeah. you, you know, why why don't you take you know, the first shot at at describing this, and then I'll I'll come in and actuate yeah. it. Yeah. So this is where sometimes the confusion uh, hits, right? So you have you have S3 that is a service and it's a uh, well a protocol um i guess you would call it a protocol it's a de facto standard for protocol like you said there's really more of a framework but the s3 service uh, amazon one of amazon's first if, if not the first service was s3 simple storage service and it's object storage in the cloud offered by amazon and it was designed in 2006 really as mm, was it file sharing i don't know if it's was, it was designed as a file sharing solution but it's more of a dropbox or a box type solution where you could put big files up into the cloud and then uh, other people could download them. One of the first use cases were some folks that wanted to put uh, satellite video up into the cloud and let researchers pull down that satellite video or satellite images and then search for aliens or whatever they search, wherever they were searching for. That was one of the first use cases. And then, then Dropbox type stuff. But uh, it was designed in 2006, long before a lot of the, the modern use cases that, uh, that are uh, out there now uh, were designed. And it, it, it did a good job. Um, and it still does a good job for you know, hundreds or thousands, thousands of customers out there. So it is a good service, but it's also the protocol that we use to interface with that service, the S3 protocol. Uh, we'll get into this more in a moment, but uh, if you are an independent software vendor, an ISV, let's say at the, your data core with the vFilo product or your Veeam or Rubrik or Convo or on the surveillance side, maybe a milestone or anybody on the uh, media asset management uh, space in Hollywood, you have to decide if you are an independent software vendor, whose object storage you want to interface with, right? And the list of object storage you know, 10, 15 years ago was long. 
right? You had AWS S3, you had IBM, Object Storage, Azure, Google, NetApp, and EMC. Of course, you had Karingo, uh, Hitachi, Fujitsu, HP. You had all these different object storage vendors. And if you wanted to make your software work with all of these, at the, you had to write a different version of your software most of the time in order for your customers to use whatever storage they wanted to. Um, uh, what ended up happening is that uh, most uh, folks wanted to start writing into Amazon, and so people started adopting that S3 protocol. So the S3 protocol can also be found, as the API can also be found on other object storage. So if you look at, uh, at Swarm, if you look at uh, Hitachi or EMC or NetApp or Google, A IBM or A AWS, uh, Azure or Wasabi, you'll find that S3 protocol is supported so that those independent software vendors could now write to other people's object storage and allow uh, their customers to use the storage backend of their choice. That's, that's what it is. Long story short, S3 is two different things. It's the service and it's the API that allows uh, independent software vendors to have their applications talk to that storage. Yeah, and I guess the point to get across is, you know, S3, the protocol is is still owned by Amazon and, and managed by Amazon. So, you know, all the advancements come from Amazon and then it's up to the service and software community to support whatever they come out with. It's a moving target. It needs to be, uh, you know, continuously uh, uh, managed. You, you You need to make sure from a software perspective that, you, know, you support the latest and greatest calls, um, you know, all, all of the menu options that, that David was talking about, you, you need to be able to support. And furthermore, uh, th there's there's different, different SDKs and different ways to integrate the S3 protocol. From, from my perspective, you know, it, going back to 2006, you know, before there was a standard, I think Amazon did did the entire industry a great service by by spending a tremendous amount of money and effort uh, pushing uh, th this type of standard, this type of protocol, uh, training the overall uh, IT ecosystem to, to really utilize REST interfaces. It, it, it took a lot of effort, a lot of time. Uh, and yeah, I, I think it did the, the entire industry a service. Of course, there were other organizations involved, you know, in Microsoft with Azure, and of course, Oracle was there, and, and then Google and, and others, but yeah, Amazon really was the first. But the point from, to, to, I want to get across here is from the S3 protocol perspective, it, it is a moving target, uh, and, and it is a de facto standard, but we use de facto for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. It's... Um, you know, it, it can change, it does change. And just because some an application supports the S3 API, it doesn't necessarily mean mean that it works with the S3 target. You, you really have to test it and make sure your workflows uh, work and are operable. Usually there's just some minor tweaks that need to be done, um, but you, you do need to go ahead and validate everything and make sure that it works from a workflow perspective. That brings us to deficiencies. All right, so so what are the deficiencies to S3? So maybe I'll 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 explain this one, David, and then you can jump in. Sure. Uh, so from from a protocol perspective, as David mentioned, it was designed to just be simple storage. It was a de designed as a ramp for other AWS services. So in 2006, uh, Amazon pretty much gave S3 away for free as they uh, tried to you know, push it into the market and and train developers to use it for their archival storage for their applications on the back end. That's how they went to market. They, they really focused on a grassroots campaign where they went and they showed developers how to use it, how to put a little link and then access it via a URL. So it was really designed to be a ramp to other AWS services. Uh, it relies on the ecosystem for apps, for content management search. So because it's simple, the ecosystem is, is where the intelligence is. So it, it's a very, very light uh, menu of options. You, you, you have your calls, your puts, your gets, uh, different versions. You do have object locking. So, you know, it, it, it is moving, you know, the intelligence is being increased, but for the most part, it, it, it's a relatively simple API, relatively limited set of, of API calls. Uh, it was designed for granular data durability and replication options, or it wasn't designed with granular data durability and replication options in mind. So again, it, it was pretty simple. You store something and then, you know, Amazon service and the way that they have architected their service uh, determines how 
things are protected and stored. They have lots of different tiers. And I think David, you, you'll you'll talk about this in a bit because you know Wasabi also has their their advantages there and how you protect it on the back end and how you expose those costs to users. You know, if if it's costing Amazon something, you are being charged for it, right? So I think that's that's the point to get across here. As as you go higher up on the functionality and and the feature set perspective, you know you you are getting charged more um, from the S3 and and the uh, the AWS side. And uh, of course, you know that that kind of leads into what's going on, on the service side. It, it's you know leads to a relatively expensive um, a relatively expensive service, right? And and it is difficult to forecast costs. And this is a, a good segue into um, you know, some of what Wasabi's done. So any, anything to add here, David, to this slide? Yeah. No, you know what, I, you did a great job covering the protocols and features. Um, I'll talk more about the, the service expenses and the difficulty of it is of forecasting costs for sure. Um, let's just jump right into it. Let's just go right to the hidden cost slide there, Adrian. Yeah. And uh, we'll talk about this. So the life, world was different in 2006, right? I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm old enough. I'm, I'm sure that some of the folks that are listening today um, probably don't remember dial-up modems or uh, ADSL, uh, you know, or the difficulty in getting network connections to to, to uh, the internet. But uh, everything was expensive. Uh, every time you cranked a CPU in order to do something that you, you know, in the cloud, you were charged for it. Every time you wanted to use any kind of network bandwidth, you were charged for it. And so the architecture in the first generation cloud storage service providers like AWS or IBM or, or even Azure, uh, they charge their customers for every possible thing that they do. Think of it, let's go back to the original, um, my, my original metaphor in the restaurant. Right? If you are the application, you're sitting at your table and you're given the menu by the waiter and you ask for uh, a glass of water. The act of the waiter walking to the water station and bringing back a glass of water, that, the act of them walking back with that cost you money. If you ask for a knife, a fork, or a spoon, and a napkin, the, the act of asking for that is going to cost you, you know, a few pennies here, a few pennies there. If you say, oh, I dropped my spoon, I'd like to have a new one, clean one, please, that act of asking for one is going to cost you a few pennies. So every time you have an API request in AWS, Azure, or Google, anybody else in the first generation clouds, the API request is going to cost the customer money. And those requests on that menu could be your API puts, or your API gets, your lists, your heads, inventory operations. If uh, if, if you ask the waiter, well, what, what's the special today? And the, he has to go to the kitchen and ask the chef what the special is. That the ask of of that of what the specials are, well, that's going to cost you as well, too. So inventory operations are all part of the, your cloud service bill from AWS. If you have a small object, okay, and some, we'll talk about tiers in a moment, but you have different tiers in these cloud storage architectures like AWS. You have your standard, your infrequent access, infrequent access, one zone, glacier, deep archive, yada, yada, yada. Uh, if you are in infrequent access, for example, and you have objects that are smaller than 128K in, in object size, they're gonna uh, they're gonna charge you a minimum object size of 128K. So your 64K objects, Will be charged will be charged 128k prices. So there's a small object tax. That's like asking you know of ordering a, a, a side salad, you know, or a small plate, you know, and and getting charged a surtax because it's not taking up the full plate, right? Um, transfer acceleration charges. If you put your data in the wrong tier in AWS, it winds up in Glacier. Um, yeah, it winds up in Glacier, and you need that back faster than the than the the average storage time return five hours, they'll charge you to get it back faster. That's your acceleration car charges. If you want to have a bucket replicated from one region to another, you're going to pay on network transfer charges. Retrieval fees, that's just the charge that you get for asking to get your data back. That's a retrieval fee. That's standard on if you're going to access and you're going to access one zone in Glacier and Deep Archive. And that's different from your egress charges. Retrieval fee is the cost of asking for it. Egress uh, charges are the cost of the transport that they use to get it back to you. And again, if you wind up in the deep archive or glacier, every object you have in there, and let's go back to our petabyte example again. If you have a billion 
objects in in Glacier or Deep Archive. That's uh, uh that's a uh, you know, a billion objects. You're gonna each one of those objects has a object overhead charge associated with it because they add metadata to that object so that they can find it when you ask for it later. So they're charging you the, the for the ability for them to find that data when they go to look for it if you ask for it back. So there's all these overhead charges, there's egress fees and API charges. All of these things are on top of the visible monthly charge of $23 a terabyte for AWS standard or, or $12.50 for infrequent access or four bucks for Glacier. Um, and all of these hidden charges make it impossible, impossible to predict what your cost is gonna be at the end of the month. It's never the same because you're always going to have different egress charges, different API request charges, different uh, uh, object overhead charges. That monthly storage charge is always going to be different in the case of AWS Azure or Google. All right, so, uh, so this is an architecture that was possibly worked well back in 2006 or 2010, um, but it, it's no longer a viable architecture for many customers these days because they don't want to be hit with the mystery charges every month and they're tired of getting nickel and dimes. So in the case of Wasabi, we've done away with that. Wasabi is different than AWS Azure or Google. Uh, we have a different architecture. Adrian, let's jump ahead to one more slide. So yeah. why is Wasabi different? Right, so it's cloud storage, just like AWS Azure or Google or IBM, uh, the difference is we don't charge for egress fees. We don't charge egress fees for you to get your data back. We don't charge our customers for the API requests. Uh, to, to You look at your, at your menu, at your table, and you say, ooh, I would like to uh, have uh, this. We're not gonna charge you for, 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 uh, for requests. We're not gonna charge you for uh, any kind of overhead charge or on net transfer charge or anything like that. We don't have... Uh, charges other than straight up storage five dollars and ninety nine dollars five dollars and ninety nine cents per terabyte per month that's all it is so if you know that you've got a hundred terabytes of uh, storage per month you know it's five hundred ninety nine dollars at the end of the month you know multiply that by 12 and you know exactly what your year costs are going to be for forecasting your, your your cloud storage bill it's simple to use easy to understand no hidden charges that's what makes wasabi different also what makes us different is there's no complex tiers so all the data that's kept in Wasabi is kept on a hot tier. That, that's it. All your data is, is available at uh, milliseconds away. All you have to do is uh, your application has to request it or you hit the, you know, hit your mouse, you know, hit the return button on your computer or, or, the, or, or your mouse and you start to get your data back. So it's always available when you want it, when you want it. There's no archive tiers that you have to wait five hours or 15 hours in order to get that data back. Our price is low enough to compete with those archive tiers, but the data comes back to you fast enough or faster in most cases, you know, uh, than the, the hottest tiers in Amazon, Azure, or Google. Yep. And we'll talk about performance, just doing a quick time check, David. We have about 10 minutes. All right. But, um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the, talk, talk, talk about performance. And, and of course, I mean, just, just to confirm again, you guys are using object storage at your core, correct? Yeah, we use object storage at the core. I mean, that's our file system. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter to uh, the end user what the file system is. Um, you know, it, it matters to the application that's sending the data to Wasabi. But uh, hell, we can be using just about anything if, you know, it, on the end side, as long as we have that API interface that allows us to work with the application that the customer is using. Customers using data core vFilo works perfect, right? So uh, on the back end side, yeah, it's object storage in the cloud, but you know, the customer doesn't need to know how to operate object storage. And, and the world's changed a lot since 2006. And object storage, I know, you, Adrian, you've been around since the beginning of object storage in the late 90s, possibly even earlier than that. And, and I've, I've been on it, too. And it, things have changed since the 2006 when the first cloud object storage architectures were designed. Right. Uh, we now have, you know, we can put terabytes and terabytes on a spinning disk, whereas Back in 2006, the highest density disk was a was one terabyte, right? Today we get 18 to 20 terabytes, you know, on on, on a disk. The amount of capacity is is outstrips what what we would have thought about in 2006. Um, Wasabi's performance is based on just a, a, a meeting hardware technology that we we've designed, and we use a, a 
proprietary uh, operating system and file system that allows us to be really efficient in how we manage our, the data and disk space and drive down costs to pass those cost savings on the customer. Our performance is also enabled by, our, we have a distributed architecture in the cloud where each Wasabi storage vault, we call them vaults, they're, they're good size uh, units, um, have a purpose-built software running on leading edge hardware that uh, is both scalable and uh, we use the concept of a user server, a database server, and a storage server. We tie those together with big, fat, 100 gigabit Ethernet pipes and load balancers and a lot of parallel processing. So as you mentioned earlier, object storage is great for a multi-tenant environment. Bingo, cloud is a multi-tenant environment, and we just have fantastic performance. And we have uh, tests that show our write performance and read performance versus AWS. And you know, depending on object size, and the number of cores you're using to write to the cloud, uh, we're going to beat uh, AWS S3, which is their, their, their most the fastest performing storage service. You know, in in our, in our case, we we ran 30, 40 tests, we beat them in 36 out of 40 tests. And if you want to uh, check that that benchmark test out, you can find it at wasabi.com/performance. And I'll give you an idea of where we are versus other cloud object storage. Yep. And then use cases. I think we, we we talked about a lot of these things as as we were having our discussion. But are there are there any you want to point out here? You know what? Backup recovery is really a fantastic fit for cloud storage. Backup recovery and archiving, right? Um, if it's really high performance, you know, and you need uh, you're all you're reading and writing and pulling stuff in and out of uh, of uh, storage like like uh, your swarm, keep that on prem. Keep that swarm piece on prem. But if you have you know, a backup and recovery need, you put stuff offsite, or maybe it's uh, it's for um, for remote access for people who work from home. Uh, you know what, you can use you use the cloud. Tape to cloud works well, archiving works well. We see more people using global file sharing. We see a lot of interest in storing video surveillance footage in the cloud. So the number of use cases uh, are growing uh, on a weekly basis, really, uh, for cloud object storage. It wasn't that case 10 years ago. Uh, now we're just doing all kinds of crazy things uh, with cloud object storage. Yeah, I guess, guess if you were to take a look at a swarm use case diagram, it'd it, it look almost the same. And there's a reason, right? O object storage is at the foundation of Wasabi. Object storage is uh, obviously, you know, swarm. Swarm is object storage. But mm -hmm. the point to get across is, you know, really depends on what your requirements are, what your cost requirements are, what your data protection requirements are, what, you know, the bandwidth connectivity that you have. You know, that, there, there's a lot of options. And, and we wanted to show two different views to users because, you know, when, when you just get one vendor's view, you don't always know that, hey, that there may be other benefits with other, other technologies. And you can combine both of these technologies in a, in a hybrid way. So, Part of the educational series is, is showing both views, you know, one from the service provider view, one from the on-prem view. Um, there are times where some of these solutions compete, but there's also times when they, they work together. And when, when you we're getting to a scale from a data perspective where you really need them to work together, you need your cloud storage service, you need your on-prem storage to work together because data sets are getting so big that they're, they're difficult to move quickly. Yep, exactly. You're exactly right, um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, the legendary entertainment. I'll just touch on it real quickly. Legendary entertainment is a Wasabi customer. Uh, they were use, uh, looking at Wasabi for um, for the use cases, backup, uh, archive, and remote collaboration. Uh, their challenge was that they needed to reduce the on-prem footprint, uh, and they wanted to eliminate some storage silos. They had tape, they had different spinning disks, they had uh, SSD out there just a bunch of different silos and they said, hey, we need to figure out a way to uh, reduce our footprint, save some money. And uh, additionally, they also had a lot of uh, video uh, footage uh, in other clouds and they wanted to lower that uh, cloud storage expense and eliminate egress fees and those hidden costs I talked about a moment ago. So uh, they looked around, uh, they tested Wasabi, they said, hey, this works well. Um, so, uh, so they they we we started uh, storing their video footage and their backup and archive and business uh, data, you know, for the last couple of years. Um, one of the important things for these guys was our support for that S3 API interface that allowed their existing S3 API applications to work with Wasabi. And uh, so on the media asset management side, Covalent was a media asset management package that they use. 
and it was important that we support that, which of course we do. And then uh, Adobe Premiere Pro, right? So, uh, you know, you have a remote work in the times of COVID, people working from home and there's a work from home mandate. And how do you do that with people working from home? You have to support that uh, Adobe Premiere Pro interface. And uh, so we did. Uh, next slide for me, Adrian. I'm gonna know we're running short on time, so I'm gonna yeah, try to wrap this up. Yeah. So, uh, right. So, as, as as Adrian mentioned before, right? Yeah. S three API compliant applications. These, you know, need to work with S three API compliant object storage, right? So, if you have a, a a independent software vendor or a piece of software that you're using today that uh, you want to make sure that it works with Wasabi, don't worry about it because AWS, Wasabi is AWS S3 compliant. Uh, everything that is from our identity and access management is uh, the same as uh, AWS itself. So um, if you have um, Adobe Premiere Pro or Covalent or DataCore vFilo or Milestone on the video management software for, for surveillance world, or you have Nasuni, for or Panzera for f global file sharing, because these guys work with AWS S3, they're going to work with Wasabi. They're going to work with uh, uh, with DataCore S1. Yep. Um, that, that this is the important piece of AWS S3 compatibility. This is yep. it. Yeah. And then, so let's let's. I mean, we're, we'll 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 close it on this slide. We we have a thank you slide. Let me just show you those, those emails really fast. Sales at wasabi.com and info at datacore.com. But I know we're we're approaching the hour here. We can go a few minutes over. If people have questions, feel free to ask your questions now if you have them. Uh, but we're, we'll we'll talk about this. You know how how do you choose the the, the solution for for your requirements? Uh, and you know, we we talked about this throughout the whole webinar. But you know I'll focus on the object storage side. You could focus on the cloud storage side, David. But you know from a capacity perspective. You know, as, as David mentions on the service side, you know, it's, it's very easy to get started with Wasabi and other services. So if anything under 100 terabytes, you know, you should really consider cloud storage. It's very easy to get set up. You put down your credit card, you can start storing. Once you get to that 100 terabyte mark, um, you you can have uh, the, the, the benefit of um, uh, or, or the economics, the, the, the benefits of, of economies of scale start to kind of kick in and you can bring that stuff, that data in-house and you can definitely optimize your costs from a long-term perspective. You know, if you're taking just a look at storing something for a few months, then you know the cloud storage is a really good solution. But if you're if you're keeping stuff for for you know years, three years, five years, ten years, you know the long-term uh, retention economies of scale really kick in from an overall data center perspective. Uh, perspective. You could fit about anywhere between 168 terabytes to 200 terabytes in, in about one U rack space. Uh, from an object storage perspective, you can get more dense. You can use SSDs. Uh, you can use uh, you know, HDDs, very cost-effective HDDs, so it's very flexible from that perspective. Um, from the ingress time to store, you're talking about internal network speed, so a lot of the times it's kind of the application requirements. Um, so, uh, you know, I know we're we're hitting the limit here. Is there from the cloud storage perspective? Is there anything you want to point out here, David? Yeah, you covered it pretty well. Uh, the only thing I'd say is uh, was, uh, was like cloud storage in general makes a great fit for primary storage overflow. If somebody's sitting, uh, they're like, okay, I need to I need to order, you know, more arrays. I need more spinning disks. I need more uh, I need more you know more boxes in my data center to support my growth and you're not going to get it on time right just you can like you said put your credit card down store some of that data you know for a percent of the time into uh, wasabi and then when you get your new gear racked and stacked egress it back out of wasabi back into your uh into your swarm because there's no charges for egress so you can move it in move it out uh, as you see fit yeah, and I think that's the point to get across. You could take a, take a hybrid approach. We're seeing more organizations take a hybrid approach. It doesn't want to. It doesn't need to be a, an either or decision. It could be both. Exactly. And there are, there, yeah, we we have technologies at DataCore that can uh, control that from a data management perspective. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of the the viewers also have those those data management applications that they already use today that can go ahead and, and manage uh, sending to to both Wasabi and and DataCore products and data DataCore you know whether it's Sans Infinity, Philo or, or Swarm.
And with that, we, we have a uh, next step. So if you have any questions for David or Wasabi, you can contact them at sales at wasabi.com. Any questions for me or Datacore, you can send an email to info at datacore.com. Of course, we have a lot of different resources on our uh, respective websites, wasabi.com and datacore.com. And I know, um, you know, we're, we're kind of hitting the end here. So I think we will wrap it up since we're already two minutes over. Uh, so if you do have any questions and we didn't answer them throughout, please go ahead and send them to either one of these uh, addresses. I'll go ahead and follow up with any questions that we didn't get to uh, throughout the webinar. And with that, David, any closing statements or comments to anyone? How, how do people get started with Wasabi? Maybe that, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a great question. All right, so hey, if, you, if you're curious, you wanna, you wanna kick the tires and give it a 30 day free trial for a terabyte, go to wasabi.com, look for the free trial button, uh, put in your uh, contact information and we will send you, we'll respond to your email with uh, free trial information. You don't, we're not gonna ask you for a credit card. We're not gonna, you won't be automatically enrolled. Kick the tires for 30 days, decide if you like it. And if you do, awesome. If you don't, eh, come back some other time. But yeah, hit the Wasabi website, look for the free trial. And uh, if you also go to our knowledge base, which is put in our resource section, you will find how Wasabi works with uh, vFilo and Swarm. So we have uh, both uh, how to uh, configure Wasabi for vFilo, how to configure Wasabi for Swarm on our knowledge base. It's, uh, it's there and it's ready for you. Yeah, and of course you get started with Datacore by going to datacore.com or talking to your regional Datacore rep, whether that's a, a partner or someone at Datacore. And with that, David, thank you so much for your time. Uh, as always, it, it's fun and informative. Thank you, and, Adrian, great time, I love you guys. Yeah, likewise, and uh, thanks to all our viewers. Thank you for spending the time with us today. All right, this concludes our webinar. Thanks everyone, bye.